Good afternoon, and thank you for joining BBC's J. Ronald Wilder Center for Housing Policy for the third webinar in our Getting Serious About Housing Supply event series. I'm Andy Winkler, BBC's Director of Housing and Infrastructure Policy. Today's session is meant to explore sort of the ins and outs of affordable housing development, and in particular, how to navigate the cost and complexity of key subsidy programs, uh, from tax credits to bonds to grants, which are typically required to make a development pencil out financially. You know, we know that fragmentation and the complexity of various subsidies and financing options can add a lot of costs and inefficiencies to the development process, adding to the overall cost of construction at a time when our housing supply challenge has never been more acute. Uh, we're really lucky today to have an extraordinarily knowledgeable group of experts for our panel to share some insights uh, for practitioners and to explore some ideas for policymakers to streamline and improve incentives to build more homes. Uh, just one kind of point of housekeeping before we get started, uh, please share any and all comments, questions, clarifications, uh, whatever thoughts you have in the chat if you're watching on YouTube or you can tweet them to uh, at BPC underscore bipartisan. You know, we, we really wanna hear from you. Um, so before our panel, I want to first introduce Elizabeth Kneebone. She is the research director at UC Berkeley's Turner Center for Housing Innovation. She has very kindly agreed to give a little level setting presentation on the building blocks of financing affordable housing construction. Uh, Elizabeth, Thank you so much for joining us. I'll go ahead and turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Andy. I uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here today and be part of this discussion. Uh, and as Andy said, I'm just going to take a, a few minutes up top to offer some framing based on the research that we've been doing over the years at the Turner Center, really in keeping with this whole webinar series theme. Like, what does it take to uh, increase supply, deliver more housing? in the places that need it most and uh, for households that are struggling the most with affordability uh, challenges and challenges accessing stable and quality housing. And to do that, that means you know, to deliver rents that are affordable to low-income households or uh, vulnerable populations really requires subsidy. And as Andy sort of teed up, that subsidy landscape that has built up uh, around this um, uh, issue area is has become very complex, right? You're, you're talking about federal, um, state, local resources, private philanthropic dollars that can be on the table in the form of tax credits, in the form of uh, loans or grants, each that can have its own goal, uh, target population, regulatory requirements or you know, strings attached. That means when you're when the more you have to bring more sources in to uh, make a deal pencil to build the kind of capital stack or the that layer of resources it takes to really build housing, uh, the more complex it can become, and the more it can shape not just the cost of the project, but who uh, who is being served uh, and how much and where housing is getting built. So again, to help ground today's conversation, I wanted to provide some research that we did on the low income housing tax credit program in particular to really uh, explore and dig deeper into this, this financing issue and this layering of this capital stack. And when I say that, the sort of that capital stack that those resources, the debt and equity it takes uh, to finance a project, that can be influenced by a number of factors. Uh, one is overall just the total development costs, which can really vary across different markets and is something that's been changing over time. Um, the value of tax credits uh, how, affects how much equity actually ends up in a deal, and that you know influences the gap that's left over and that's needed to fill, um, and how many layers it ultimately it will take to fill that gap. Uh, the availability of federal resources, um, the sort of soft sources that can fill that gap, influence the capital stack, and the availability of state and local resources. Some states have tax credits uh, or the financing sources. Some localities uh, have resources available. So again, uh, this, this ecosystem can really influence what the ultimate number of sources look like and uh, the sort of costs and requirements that come along with it. If we focus in, in particular, as an example, on uh, new construction that's been uh, undertaken using the 9% uh, tax credit uh, in, over the last two decades, what we can see is, one, uh, the development costs have increased 
over time, and so too have the number of sources. So we've seen the number, and I, I want to clarify here that these are loans that are coming in on top of the tax credits in terms of number of sources. On average, that's doubled over the last two decades from two to four on, on top of the tax credits. And this is a particular issue, um, more so in some places than others, and for some kinds of projects more than others. Uh, so for instance, if we look at three similar projects that have been built, or there were, were, uh, rather were awarded tax credits in 2019, uh, we see differences quickly begin to emerge uh, in the financing and the costs of these projects. So th these examples here are Atlanta, Alexandria, uh, and in Los Angeles. And all of these projects were large family projects um, of about 80 units that, again, were awarded uh, the 9% new construction uh, tax credit. What we see first off very clearly is the total development cost of these projects looks very different. It's much more expensive uh, to, to deliver these units to build in Los Angeles than, for instance, Atlanta. We can also see though that there are differences in terms of the share of equity in the deals versus uh, the debt that had to be uh, assembled. And then also the number of sources. So the Los Angeles project has uh, five uh, uh, additional sources on top of the state and federal tax credits that went into that projects, uh, for example. And again, it's not just the, the geography and the sort of market and state context that can shape uh, how these deals come together. It's also the type of project. So if we stay in Los Angeles, um, we can look at, again, on the left is that uh, project that was on the previous slide, the large uh, family um, project, about 80 units. On the right is um, a permanent supportive housing project that was also awarded uh, tax credits in the same year in Los Angeles. And what we quickly see is, well, again, similar size projects, similar total development costs, the number of sources going into that permanent supportive housing project uh, is much greater, several more layers uh, of complexity uh, to administer in delivering that project. And this complexity uh, matters, again, as Sandy said up top and, and I alluded to earlier, uh, because it does carry both direct and indirect costs for a project. So in terms of uh, direct costs, uh, we know that, that the more project, uh, the more project has to deal with multiple sources and compliance and the legal fees that you see direct costs in terms of staff time. Uh, and, and legal fees, and also the opportunity costs that there are associated with the staff having to spend longer to bring more um, uh, funding sources into the deal. Um, but there are also indirect costs that can influence uh, the, the bottom line of a project. Um, one, you know, the, they're, uh, not all of these funding sources, they're often not aligned in terms of the timeline. Uh, and the longer you have to wait to bring in that final source or the longer that stretches, the more there are carrying costs, construction costs can, can increase over that period. So ultimately they can have impacts uh, on the total cost of the project. Um, and then we also know that, the, that some sources carry different strings attached or requirements or targeting uh, that can influence what kinds of units are built for whom uh, that may have actual requirements in terms of uh, wages paid, for instance. Um, so that that all together can, can increase the complexity, but also shape what actually gets built at the end of the day and who can actually be served by those units. In the research um, that we conducted on this, we also did dozens of interviews with industry and stakeholder experts across the country to see where, where this is uh, maybe there are some lessons learned or opportunities to increase efficiencies or uh, to share best practices that could help reduce some of these pain points. Because uh, again, this can vary from state to state uh, and across the country, across different markets. What we heard in terms of uh, best practices lifted up or things that seem to work well is uh, many stakeholders pointed out that it's sometimes it's not so much the number of sources, it's the number of agencies. Uh, that one has to address, especially if they are not coordinated with each other. So uh, the, to the extent that, that multiple sources can run through one agency, that helps reduce some of that friction. Um, where that's not possible, when there's active coordination across agencies, that too can increase efficiencies and deliver some of those that, that streamlining, uh, whether it's achieved through a, a task force, um, some states uh, noted mem memorandums of understanding that help them better coordinate across multiple funding pots. Um, other places, we're lifting up uh, examples of actually being able to have 
uh, consolidated applications so that there's this one point of entry or and and then we'll hear from massachusetts actually having coordinated loan documents can really uh, ease some of the, the inefficiencies and 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 produce some cost savings um and every person we spoke with regardless of the model we were talking about when there was a sort of efficiency or a model of streamlining in place that seemed to be working well. Um, they noted the importance of having leader, like the leadership buy-in that from the top, there was a real commitment to achieving these efficiencies and then down the line staff capacity uh, and buy-in to help actually execute uh, on these streamlining and coordination um, strategies. And that, that long-term capacity is so important because as people turn over, uh, as new funders or funding sources may come into the mix, we need that infrastructure in place to really sustain these types of innovations and, and uh, efficiencies. And I think uh, these sort of, the, that feedback and these, these, the, these you know, best practices and models that have emerged from, from across the country, I think not only carry lessons for other states uh, and, and across the board, thinking about how we can improve what's already in the pipe, so to speak, but as the federal government considers increasing funding uh, for production through existing channels or by creating new programs, I think there are definitely some key takeaways and lessons uh, to, to lift up here, which is one, reducing fragmentation wherever possible. That can be very challenging with existing funding sources, but if we're thinking about putting new money into the, into the pool, how do we do that in a way that doesn't just exacerbate uh, fragmentation? Creating better alignment through, through the sort of one-stop shop approach or uh, just being able to coordinate more effectively at a state or regional level uh, so that if you do have multiple uh, pools of funding, they can break together more effectively and efficiently so those subsidies stretch further. Uh, and finally, uh, to that capacity point, that investing in that, in that long-term capacity is, is critical so that these types of coordinated structures uh, and efficiencies can really be sustained over the long term and again making the most out of the subsidies that we do have. Uh, and so with that, I would uh, turn this back over to Andy and really look forward to the conversation with the, the great panel today. Thank you. Thanks for that presentation, Elizabeth. Um, and so now it is my privilege to welcome our three additional speakers joining us for this discussion. Uh, we have Amy Anderson, she's a Senior Vice President and lead social impact and sustainability specialist at Wells Fargo. She most recently served as the chief housing officer for LA's mayor, Eric Garcetti. We also have Orlando Cabrera. He is a partner in the real estate practice of law firm Arnold Golden Gregory. And he is a former assistant secretary for public and Indian housing at HUD and a, a friend of BPC. Um, and then we have Crystal Cornegay. She is the executive director of Mass Housing, which is Massachusetts State Housing Finance Agency. And uh, most importantly, she is a member of BPC's Housing Council. She's terrific. And always, uh, Crystal, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate all of you for joining us. Elizabeth did a really fantastic job helping us unpack some of the factors that, uh, that can impact what a developer can build in today's market, um, some of the differences between different communities, different states. Uh, maybe just to start, uh, each of you could share just a few words about kind of your roles and how you see these factors play out uh, in your day-to-day -day jobs and in your efforts to try to build more housing. Uh, maybe we can start with you, Amy. Oh, great. Thanks, Andy. Um, you know, uh, so so my role, uh, Wells Fargo made a commitment about uh, a, uh, two and a half years ago to invest uh, a billion uh, philanthropic dollars towards housing affordability. Um, and that investment is being focused in four areas. One is to expand home ownership, uh, especially for households of color. Um, uh, housing uh, stability uh, programs like eviction prevention and foreclosure prevention, uh, policy and research, and uh, expanding the supply of affordable homes um, strategies to support increased production of, of affordable homes. Um, I have to admit, uh, Andy, that on a day-to-day -day basis, I'm not dealing uh, as regularly with the uh, issues that uh, Elizabeth uh, highlighted. Um, but in uh, my former life, I uh, really have spent the vast majority of my career as an affordable housing developer. 
Um, and, you know, I think, uh, you know, one example I would share of how significant I think the, the consequences of this layering approach can be um, are, uh, are highlighted here in Southern California, in Los Angeles in particular, uh, and that is around the consequence of, of time and how much time this layering approach adds to the development process. Um, you know, I worked on a development that um, because not only uh, does uh, were the applications, uh, you know, infrequent and competitive, but there was a certain order in which, uh, you know, funding uh, needs to get committed to a project and, uh, you know, missing uh, one application uh, time period meant that the project got pushed uh, an entire year. So I, I raise that as an example because I think in a community like uh, Los Angeles where um, creating supportive housing units and trying to address the homelessness crisis has, been, has become the policy priority. If you can't build the units fast, if you can't get the financing together quickly, you start to lose the trust of policymakers and the and the public. So I I guess I lift that up because the consequence of this approach and this system isn't just about individual transactions. It's really about you know uh, a, a, a public commitment. Um, and how we can maintain a, a public commitment to try and demonstrate that, uh, you know, building more units is an effective way to end homelessness. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, that's really, really helpful. Maybe I'll turn to Orlando to pick up from there since he has been involved in, I don't know, what would you say, Orlando, hundreds, thousands of, of individual developments from the well, legal side of things and even more before that in your time at HUD, uh, maybe you can pick up what Amy said and, and go from there. Yeah, enough that I, I, I can't count them, probably not thousands on affordable housing, but uh, uh, certainly a lot. Um, I am a recovering developer and Amy cited so many things that um, are so true. Uh, and not just that, I'm a recovering developer um, in SoCal. Uh, so the idea of going through the process and making sure your capital stack is congruent and uh, makes sense with respect to how you finally get to executable form, right? All of this is about execution. That is really time consuming and difficult, particularly with different sources. I'm also a recovering HFA executive director and then there you have another set of concerns, which is you have a responsibility to allocate 9% uh, credits and, and or private activity bonds and 4% credits in a way that um, is responsible to your enabling legislation, responsible to the service and gets housing done. So you do exactly what Amy said, you prove to your your stakeholders, not your constituency, your stakeholders, that in fact things are moving forward and that there's progress. Then I'm a recovering assistant secretary, and um, and there you have a bunch of very different um, concerns. And I know that the, my my former and well loved family from HUD. A good many of them are on this call, and, and so they'll understand. And I, this is in their defense. Their job is to fundamentally make sure that they perform what Congress told them to do. Very often, HUD gets blamed for things that has nothing to do with HUD, and it's something, you know, as as a recovering HUDster, it's something that's really frustrating. Where someone says, "Well, HUD said you can do this. HUD says you can't do that." Well, typically, it's not HUD that said you can or can't do something, it's Congress that said you can or cannot do something. And it's HUD job, HUD's job to tell you, hey, Congress said you can't do that. 
uh, then HUD uh, proceeds to get blamed. Now, there's a lot we can talk about in terms of what HUD can and cannot improve. But uh, I think the beginning point is the law. We had um, HOTMA passed, it's incredible to me, seven years ago. Um, the, the HOTMA is the Housing Opportunity Through Modernization Act. It was, you know, other than MARA and maybe CORA, the most significant change in, um, in, in legislation impacting uh, HCV and PBV in quite some time. And it helped, and it helped. But ultimately, I think, um, just coming back to the mantra that Amy started, and one I want to pick up on and, and continue to promote, if I were to begin someplace, I would suggest to my, uh, my HUD colleagues that we need to think more expansively and trust public housing agencies and public housing authorities those are, are, uh, those are different concepts, one's federal, one's state, uh, more. Uh, they need to be given more um, bandwidth that will require more congressional action beyond HOTMA. Uh, but, but we should look for that because at the end of the day, those public housing authorities that are allocating HCV in whichever form they are, their ultimate mission is to pre prevent all this stuff, to fund all this stuff, right? To either house people and keep them from homelessness or uh, undertake supportive housing, which many of my clients that are housing authorities do in an aggressive way and encouraging them to do that without worrying about um, every single uh, nuance uh, uh, or operational nuance that a housing authority has to undertake, I think would be a, a good conversation to have. The second one for my HFA brethren is this. It's guys, you gotta understand the section eight side because it's gonna impact your deals more every day. Massachusetts is very forward looking. It's my home state, of course it's forward looking. Um, uh, and uh, they've done a great job, you know, both mass housing um, and uh, 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 an HCD have done a great job of understanding the nuances of, uh, of 1437 FO uh, 13, um, that's section eight O and everything that can be done with that. And, 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 and that's terrific. And this is not meant critically, but everybody else has to do the same thing. Some states are extremely strong. California comes to mind, um, uh, other states less so. And uh, it, the problem is that when you're going through deal flow, when you're trying to get a deal done, and for example, you're in a RAD transaction and your housing authority and their development partner chooses PBV, you need to know as an HFA what the difference is between PBV and PBRA. Those are not just minor technical differences and they do drive a timeline and you have to accommodate that. And finally, to my, my fellow, well, my former fellow developers, as I am a recovery developer, um, the, the thing I would, uh, the, the thing that I think I tell all of my clients who are in the private sector and who are developers is you also need to use imagination and you need to remember that those other parties, they have interests to protect too. And they're legitimate interests and you have to accommodate them. You know, becoming frustrated and suddenly saying they're just not working with me. Um, that that's not an answer. Housing authorities have to answer to their boards and their communities and have to answer to HUD. HFAs have to answer to their, in some cases, the boards, in some cases, the legislature. And uh, HUD has to answer to Congress and to whoever is running HUD at the time. And I think that that I, if we would, if we could just ma wave a magic wand and get to a point of understanding something in terms of efficacy of deal flow, it's everybody needs to understand everybody else's um, intrinsic interests. That will make your deal go faster. If you become an impediment by not understanding, that will slow down your deal. So um, I've taken up too much time and I wanna punt to Crystal who is far more interesting than me. Thanks, Orlando. Yep, Crystal, I, I would love for you to take on, Orlando cited quite a few examples of HFAs. You play such a critical role too in financing um, developments in your state. Mass housing has done some really incredible work, has some uh, 
incredibly sophisticated and complicated deals they've pulled together. So maybe you can outline just a little bit about your role as, as executive director, the role your HFA plays in the state, and you know maybe some of your successes and advice for, for your peers and practitioners uh, watching today. Sure, thank you. Um, um, thank you all for having me be on the panel with you. Uh, special shout out to Elizabeth for uh, organizing the complicated capital stack in a way that would be easily accessible. Um, and so, and thanks Orlando to um, uh, shouting out around Massachusetts. Mass housing is basically the state's HFA, but we're unique in the sense that we are sister agency, the Department of Housing and Community Development, which is an uh, executive branch agency, which belongs to the administration. They're the administrator of tax credits um, and other federal programs, but we work in lockstep with them around that stuff. Um, as Orlando alluded to, Massachusetts has a very sophisticated system uh, for affordable housing finance and um, has been doing it for a long time. One of the things that people talked about was um, uh, universal application, which we call the one stop. Um, we've been doing that 20 ish years. And so if you're doing an affordable housing development in Massachusetts, no matter what kind of perch you're sitting at, whether it's local, state, uh, public, private, everybody takes the one stop. Um, and so if we're going to think about a thing like that for the federal government, then that would be a place to go, right? Because it's a way in which you get to describe the different layers and how they play together, uh, which is a big thing around uh, talking about what Elizabeth talked about in terms of complexity and um, just getting people to like kind of talk together. What we do in our system is we make the developer figure all of that out. Like who's talking to who, um, which source wants what, and how we do that. And um, we could get rid of a lot of kind of middleman, so to speak, around that. If we had a universal application, everybody bought into that, what were the questions to ask, and everybody could look at what that meant. Uh, uh, Massachusetts also went one step further and did um, what we call, uh, I don't know what we call it actually, it's like, but the universal closing docs. And so there's like loan docs in which every source buys into what those loan docs are. Um, it doesn't, it doesn't work in theory the way it sounds, um, but we continue to move forward with that it at least starts with a place of what the documents are. And I think um, if we could kind of get that universally from the federal level, because a lot of the funds that go into these deals start with low-income housing tax credits, as, as Elizabeth pointed out. And then if you add local sources and figure out how they match into these deals, then you get some sophistication and some kind of, um, what am I trying to, like, uh, like evenness around how folks are, are, are looking into that. Um, I loved Orlando's, he's like a recovering this and a recovering that. And I kept thinking, I was like, yeah, I'm an active user. <laughs> not really going to the, you know, to the meetings, like I'm an active user. And so um, really trying to understand like kind of what the teams are and how we can help them and how we can move them through the processes related to doing that. The thing that we often forget around um, why there are so many different uh, funding sources at different levels is because um, the benefit of that is like when a deal goes bad, we get everybody at the table. Everybody's at the table trying to figure out how to make it work. And so if you have one funding source 
and a deal goes bad, then it's a little more difficult to figure out how to make it work. And so now the difference is, do you need one or 12? It's like, what is the, you know, what's the middle ground and how does that work um, in Massachusetts? Because um, we are small but mighty um, in the sense that um, we put out uh, well over um, $150 million of subsidy through uh, tax credits, uh, soft debt, different uh, local um, uh, statewide tax credits, all that kind of stuff. We put that out annually in terms of what we're doing for affordable housing deals. And so we already get a lot of folks in, in the deal. If something doesn't work, we rarely come across deals that um, don't work unless there's some extenuating circumstances, market conditions, um, sometimes very rarely a, um, a sponsor, you know, implodes, that kind of thing. Um, and so we can all get together and figure out what to do with that. I'm not saying it's, it's easy, but, um, but because we have a network in which we all work together, um, it works out pretty well. And so I, I think if we are going to advocate for something, um, how to align resources, one of the things I was going to talk about uh, is the, with the ARPA dollars, an example is with the ARPA funding, um, the state and local um, recovery funds, they, um, folks want to use that with, you know, um, affordable housing development in the filling gaps, but Treasury has decided that it can only be a grant and not a loan. And that creates all kinds of problems with the tax credit program and the other kinds of programs. And so there's a little bit like when you're on the ground and you're a developer, it's like, why can't they just talk to each other and make it work? And so, um, so it's those kinds of things where um, we're hopeful that through um, bipartisan policy center and other voices, we can, you know, align resources so that we can get things to happen more quickly um, and serve people more efficiently. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so I, I, I want to remind everybody, I have seen a few questions pop in already in the chat, so we will get to those and I'll, I'll put them in throughout the, the program and we'll save some time at the end for, for the rest of the questions. There was one quick follow-up, Crystal, on um, somebody asked about single family housing, um, which obviously when we're talking about subsidies, we often specifically are talking about multifamily affordable rental housing, often it's, um, you know, we're thinking about cities, even though there is clearly a need for subsidies around rural communities. But maybe, Crystal, if you could talk about any sorts of funding streams available for, for single family housing and what your, your role is in that sense. That's my new favorite thing, to talk <laughs> about uh, single family housing. Um, but really, um, my new favorite thing, I will say, uh, mass housing's thing is to really, how do we um, really uh, kind of raise the, not, not level of awareness, but raise the kind of urgency related to single family development as in relation to the racial wealth gap. And so we have, we in Massachusetts looked around and was like, hey, you know, the pandemic is, you know, I'm sure is happening to many of the communities and folks who are represented here. Uh, when we look at communities that were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, they, they you know, look and feel and, you know, smell and taste like communities um, that have traditionally been, you know, underinvested in, um, you know, locked out of, you know, opportunity. And so one of the things we did, this was before the pandemic. So, 
kudos to um, Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito, kudos to the administration for recognizing this as an issue was, you know, just to think about how do we bring, um, uh, you know, capital dollars into creating a market that's related to uh, home ownership opportunities for people of color in communities of color. And, you know, and so we, we also need to be advocating for, um, you know, communities of color and home ownership opportunities. Mass Housing started a workforce housing program about six, seven years ago, because as many people can talk to in their market, um, we saw, you know, folks in what we would call non, a little higher than traditional um, uh, light tech housing, affordable housing, uh, their AMIs, they were locked out of markets and we were just like, okay, like we don't have a thing to deal with them, uh, to help them get into markets, into urban communities. And so we started this program and we started just like saying like people at like this AMI, like we should not be only figuring out how to create rental opportunities for them, right? It's like, we need to be thinking about how to create home ownership opportunities for them. Um, and so we just kind of got into that. And so I would say for folks uh, on, you know, in the uh, li listening, it's like, if you're thinking about not like affordable housing is a very particular thing. And um, we, in Massachusetts, uh, we have a very sophisticated system for how to do that. But when you start to talk about kind of moderate income housing and what you're talking and what you're thinking about, you need to be uh, focused on both rental and home ownership. And what that looks like in your community is kind of like up to you, what the market is, who the developers are, how much resources you have to put toward it, et cetera, so. Thanks, Crystal. Um, so I, I wanna get to people's questions, even though it's a little early. Um, one came in from, from Catherine um, that asked, you know, would eliminating tax credits to developers and spending these dollars on direct subsidies to renters shorten the time for development. Maybe I'll turn this one to you, Elizabeth, because you did talk about all, um, you know, the different subsidies that exist. I think a lot of times people focus on on tax credits and some of those sort of upfront um, sort of subsidies. But maybe you could talk a little bit about um, how how you know guaranteed vouchers or things like that really factor into the full. Uh, cost and life cycle of the project and how, how folks should think about, you know, what what would the, what difference would it make where the subsidy goes? I mean, that's a great question. And I also, our recovering developers should should weigh on in, on this as well with their perspectives. But um, I, I think that the challenge is that, especially as you're trying to serve very low income, the, you know, the deeper the subsidy, the lower the income you're trying to serve, that's where you end up getting uh, multiple layers. So whether it's a tax credit, whether it's a direct subsidy, it's it's the amount of subsidy that's needed that can lead to this complexity. And, it, and so not one single source may solve this, it's at least the way the current system is functioning uh, because you are still gonna be grappling with multiple different deadlines that may not be aligned. Uh, Orlando, you, you brought this up earlier, the role of project-based vouchers in development, especially for uh, permanent supportive housing. That's that doesn't show up in the capital stack, but it does influence the capital stack and how much the project can take on. Uh, and often, you know, that it it is really localized in terms of how well coordinated the allocation of those um, PBVs are with other funding sources. So there's a lot of complexity layered in throughout the system, the way it's currently structured, that uh, does kind of take a more holistic system-wide approach to to really address the pain points of the, the length and timelines. But again, I'd love to hear from our, our recovering developers on that too. May, may I add to what Elizabeth said? Yeah, Just absolutely. Please. So the low income housing tax credit is not a, a it's not a, uh, a tax appropriation, it's a tax expenditure. 
it's actually uh, scored at a very low number by, um, by the Congressional Budget Office. A tax expenditure means that there is no appropriation going through um, either the House Appropriation Committees or Senate budget to provide money. And in fact, what it is is a device which is uh, allocated by HFAs through qualified allocation plans. Uh, every state has a different qualified allocation plan. And that then induces the private sector to invest in single purpose entities uh, in order to acquire the credit and acquire the benefits of the credit, which is depreciation and passive losses. And Amy can speak to the importance of that for a place like Wells Fargo, but that's a very different thing than an appropriation of money for purposes of public housing, HCV, PBV of HCV or PBRA. That's Congress taking money, tax revenue, and providing it. One of the reasons that LIHTC works so well and has produced so much is because we have had a very uneven history when we have directly funded the building of affordable housing through a direct expenditure of appropriation. That's just, uh, that's a, 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 a historical trend that goes back well before 1937 when the Housing Act was enacted, that goes back into the 1920s. Um, housing didn't just begin as a concept in 1937. We've been dealing with it for quite some time. But those times when Congress appropriated directly to those who would build, um, there were stories that were troubling from a taxpayer perspective. Uh, there are a lot fewer stories that are troubling in the lie tech world because that's not an appropriation. So, so I guess that that's the immediate answer. And the, other, the second answer would be that even though you would, uh, if let's say that you wanted to reallocate the, the tax expenditure, convert it somehow to appropriation, the political will to do that in Congress and increase the score of housing is very low on both sides of the aisle. Um, Congress is not crazy about the idea of taking something that is a low cost program and creating a full cost program for itself that they will then have to fund annually every year through, for example, things like the operating fund and the capital fund. They've for years been trying to figure out ways to, to candidly appropriate less. Uh, things have gotten in the way of that. HERA was uh, the first major uh, in, uh, major legislation that impacted the operating fund, capital fund in a positive way, because prior to that, for 15 years, Congress had been squeezing the operating fund and the capital fund um, uh, and, and making it very difficult for public housing agencies. I, I, can, I, can, I can speak to that out of personal experience. Um, since HERA, it's been better, not perfect. And now with Build Back Better, you know, it's $170 billion originally, $170 billion appropriation, which is going to be cut down simply because you have to price it within that $1.75 billion. But it contemplates significant, you know, five and 10 year money to the capital fund, the operating fund, HCV, other HUD programs. That's pretty helpful. It's a big investment. That's a big investment of actual money where LIHTC is not. LIHTC is simply a tax expenditure. Thanks, Orlando. Uh, I wanted to get to, it, it's sort of related to this point, um, and, and Brian asked a question in the chat, um, you know, that we've been talking about tax credits and subsidies, but, you know, what number would you need to create enough housing? Um, and so there's there's a statistic from the, the Realtors Commission to report um, that said, you know, we have an underbuilding gap from the last, you know, sort of 20 years of potentially five and a half to six and a half um, you know, million housing units. When we're talking about even what would be historic investments in housing that are included in Build Back Better, you know, that's not nearly enough to build six million new homes to make sure that every extremely low-income family, every low-income family, every family in America has a, a safe, decent, accessible, affordable home. Um, so Amy, maybe you can speak to this sort of question of, you know, uh, 
when we're thinking about tax credits and subsidies, what's the sort of, you know, how much would really be needed? Um, and clearly, never enough. Um, we won't get enough from Congress um, to be able to do that. So, you know, what is the role of the private sector and how do you balance, um, how do you, you target these subsidies towards the very lowest income folks, make sure that they have a place to live, but, you know, how do you leverage those dollars to, to truly address our, our acute supply challenge? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you said it right there, Andy, is the acute supply challenge, right? I think um, we're not going to be able to finance our way, right? Uh, subsidize our way out of this uh, out of this housing crisis, and uh, alongside uh, 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 units that are subsidized with with government sources, we simply need to be building more housing right it's you know there is a there is an impact between the uh the supply and 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 the demand and that the rents are increasing because our supply is so significantly constrained um you know for me i think it's really exciting to see um the higher levels of government uh, be thinking about and trying to take a more active role in land use policy um, to have the federal government, uh, you know, thinking about how to incorporate incentives to encourage states to encourage localities uh, to create more supportive and flexible land use policies, I think, uh, is you know, is a, is a new milestone. Uh, you know, here in California, uh, we have some really, I think, impressive examples of the state deciding that it can no longer leave land use policy to localities because those localities are, are, are interested in themselves um, and interested in trying to be responsive to to the voters who are often, you know, single uh, single family homeowners. Um, so I think it's really important at those, um, you know, at the at the higher levels of government for their the uh, the, the policies to be more directive. Um, you know, I think a good example is uh, the legislation that was recently adopted in California called SB nine, which. Um, you know, uh, basically allows for the development potentially of up to four units on all single family lots. So, uh, you know, Wells Fargo is uh, also uh, in, in investigating how it can be some more supportive of the development of accessory dwelling units. Um, many states, many localities have shifted their regulations to allow for the development of a of an ADU on a single family lot. Uh, but now there are other barriers uh, to, um, to, 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 to getting more of those units built around financing and the capacity of, of homeowners to, to do that work. So we're exploring uh, you know, what role uh, the foundation uh, can, can play in, in trying to get more of that gentle density built because um, you know, that's a very interesting strategy for how to increase supply, right? Recognizing that uh, single family zoned property is incredibly under underutilized and, you know, let's maintain character, uh, but get a few more units built. Thanks, Amy. Uh, so we had a another question come in and maybe I'll turn this one to you, Orlando, from, from Daniel about white tech in a specific question about it being exempt from Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act, and just a general question, and there, I think there were a couple comments about how we finance um, uh, uh, accessible housing mm -hmm. for people with disabilities and older adults, given our, our aging population, that the current market is sort of woefully uh, underserving uh, the need for more accessible housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, uh Low income housing tax credit units are not uh, deemed federally assisted housing by uh, Congress uh, or HUD. In fact, they're ex specifically excluded from the definition of federally assisted housing. 
when you're excluded from the definition of federally assisted housing, uh, um, it means that uh, you have a different set of Title VIII obligations. Title VIII is the Fair Housing Act. Um, than you would in the marketplace with respect to some things. So Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973 has to do with uh, what, you, what you have an obligation to do as a landlord to provide certain accommodations for those people covered under that act. That act is not, it, it, that, first of all, that act is incredibly important. Um, uh, and I'm going to come to its importance and how it's applied in LIHTC in a second. But that is that act is not the principal mover uh, or principal protector of either uh, the disabled or the other folks who are covered by the Fair Housing Act. Um, uh, the Fair Housing Act covers families, covers um, discrimination against folks because of race, uh, because of religion. Um, uh, it does not, by the way, cover discrimination against people because of age. That was not in the act. It still isn't. The way that's handled is through the Housing for Older Persons Act of 1996, which provides a safe harbor and allows uh, 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 for elderly housing to be designated elderly housing if you receive federal assistance. Why am I answering this way? It's because it's a weave. It's not just one law. And so the way that, that as a policy matter, HUD assures that its uh, grantees or recipients comply with the Fair Housing Act is to provide affirmative covenants in its grants that say, if you receive federal funds, you thereafter must comply with these many laws. And one of them is section 504 which is the indirect way that 504 winds up being applied to LIHTC deals that receive federal assistance in the form of, again, PBV or PBRA, for those of us going through RAD, uh, or PBV generally when a housing authority allocates PBV into a deal. Uh, or if you receive home funds into the transaction, that's, uh, that's the other one. Or if there's a CDBG, grant not to the SPE, but for the benefit of a development, that may be another way to, to do it. But because LIHTC, you know, the beginning point of LIHTC is not federally assisted housing, there are a different set of obligations than when it is federally assisted housing. Thanks, Orlando. So I wanted to uh, touch on a little, which we haven't yet. Um, and Elizabeth, you laid out quite a few sort of potential best practices, opportunities um, to, to better coordinate funds, to have a single point of contact, to, to limit um, loan documentation, consolidate them. But I, you know, our, our system is so complex. I'm wondering if you could comment just a little bit about how, how to do things differently. You know, I think there's an inherent uh, benefit to sort of institutional players in this space, how could you talk a little bit about how your kind of recommendations translate to particularly rural and tribal and underserved communities who, who really do not have the, the technical expertise to, to be able to access some of these programs that, um, you know, like we've all said, are extremely costly and extremely complex. Uh, to, to that end, you know, I think that that is, that's definitely a priority research area for us right now at, at Turner Center. We have some ongoing projects underway right now that really get at the heart of what you're talking at here about capacity and whose job is it to build capacity in these places? Because uh, it, it, not just with existing funding sources, but especially if we're able to secure additional investments, whether through Build Back Better or some other uh, legislation that can actually increase the pot of money uh, or the add additional layers of, of money to the to the table. Um, I think I think that is a central question about how do we take some of these best practices, which are you know often emerging in places that are sophisticated and have a, a great deal of, of capacity. Also, I should also point out that not every state deals with the same level of fragmentation or the same complexities that a Massachusetts or California is grappling with. Um, but 
uh, all the same, there there is a lot of nuance and complexity in navigating these sorts of deals and really making sure that however many subsidies we're braiding, that they're going to the communities that need them most and the communities uh, and populations that are most vulnerable or underserved, I think comes back to this need for additional investments in that infrastructure, in the delivery infrastructure for under-resourced communities and hard to reach communities. And I do think that there are high capacity institutions and intermediaries that we can look to for some lessons learned uh, or what it takes, but without the federal government really stepping into that role, it's hard to see this happening at any kind of scale. I mean, I think philanthropy has played an important role in seeding kind of demonstrations or showing what can happen at a, at a local level. Um, local governments, state governments have taken different uh, steps in that direction, but to really nationally uh, uh, address this issue, particularly in underserved uh, and, and distressed communities, I think the federal government is gonna need to invest uh, more significantly in the technical assistance and, and capacity building. Thanks, and uh, so Orlando made a point kind of at the outset about, um, you know, HUD, other agencies, they're taking their directives from, from how programs have been created by Congress. And a lot of the rules, regulations, everything else that is in place is meant um, uh, at one point or another had a, a, a reason. You know, it, it existed to, for example, reduce fraud, waste, abuse, make sure dollars are being spent effectively. Um, but maybe, you know, first Crystal, then Orlando, you could briefly comment on you know, what opportunities are there to kind of remove some of these regulations to put trust uh, where the dollars actually end up um, so that you reduce some of this complexity and that, um, you know, local officials, state officials like yourself could, could better meet the needs of your communities without all of the hoops. I think you're on mute, Crystal. Uh, sorry about that. That's a great question. I would say that one of the things that we have been consistently doing and ramping up our efforts around that is to help localities understand that uh, developers are their delivery system, right? In the absence of uh, a locality being able to deliver affordable housing, affordable housing options, even in relation to um, uh, vouchers and such, like there's a community that's a delivery system, like as, as an instrumentality or, um, you know, a municipality, like you don't actually do anything, right? Like, and so you've got to be, instead of thinking of them as the big bad developer, or the such and such, you gotta understand that they are your partner, right? They're how you get things done. And so what does that mean? What does that look like? How you treat them and how to transform that relationship so that you know everybody can get things done. And as somebody was uh, talking earlier, is like as a state agency, like, you know, I've got all kinds of compliance things I have to deal with. And so if we're partners, then we're talking about how, how to, you know, make the things work together as opposed to me saying to the developer, here's what I got to do. And I'm saying like, well, I can't really do things that way. Um, I think um, that is a, a, a big lesson learned, particularly as we move forward with ARPA money uh, local resource money and the time frame in which we have to move that money. Um, so, so go ahead, right 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 Sorry, I, did you want me to or? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. We're, we're about at time, so I'll go to okay. you and then maybe Amy can have the last word on how you balance this sort of, um, sure. you know, the, the complexity of the programs with the need to, to reduce waste fraud and abuse. Um, so, so the, the two sticking points that immediately hit me are, uh, uh, and this is not a knock at mass housing at all. It's just a comment at all HFAs. Um, and, and I say this as a guy who ran one. Um, there is a habit of incrementalism and in regulation for any bureaucracy. And what happens is that they take on their mission and then notwithstanding the fact that a law says, here is what you need to be concerned with. 
And in this case, the law I'm thinking about would be uh, actually the several laws are section 42 of the code or the Housing Act of 37. Um, and, and in both cases, you have Congress telling you, here's your concern. And then an HFA or a public housing authority decides to add something to it that is well-intentioned and trying to address something, some other concern, but it essentially becomes an add-on and something that will slow the allocation of the resource. So that's one. The second thing is something um, I believe Elizabeth mentioned earlier. I, I think that we need to think through land use issues very carefully, because in my experience for most LIHTC deals, you know, as a recovering developer, especially in Southern California, I looked for places where I did, where I could develop as of right or as close to develop as of right as possible. Why? Because going through city council is not, is not a, a happy experience. And so what you would do is deliberately look for those places where you minimized having to do or go through that process, mostly because there are so many city councils in Southern California with so many different policies, you never knew where you would wind up. I could be in the city of Los Angeles and everything would be great because Mayor Garcetti and his predecessor were pretty open to affordable housing. I can go a hundred miles east and point you to a specific municipality well, that will do anything it can to make it untenable to do affordable housing, even though they need more affordable housing per capita than mm -hmm. any other place in, South, in Southern California. And so, so that would be the second place. Um, uh, and then the third place I've already mentioned, which is just getting Congress to make it easier for public housing authorities to basically do what they need to do and getting out the resources. Thanks, Orlando. Amy, any final thoughts before we close it out? Yeah, I was actually uh, going to really kind of take it to the statutory level, right, when these programs are, uh, at least at the state level or the local level, are adopted by voters or uh, elected officials. I think uh, there's the potential to fall into this vicious cycle uh, related, again, to this question of public trust which is that the program that is adopted by a locality or adopted by voters is increasingly narrow in who it's trying to serve. And I think that is oftentimes in response to this sense that the public has lost trust so that in order to regain that trust, you have to be very specific uh, and narrow about how funds will be used, but then it becomes much harder to fulfill that commitment and to fulfill that obligation because your your commitment is too narrow, right? You mm -hmm. can't, um, right? The funds don't get spent quickly enough or efficiently enough, and the people don't get served quickly enough and efficiently enough if you're putting your developers in a place where they need to combine you know, uh, a program that helps people with mental health disabilities and senior veterans, right? It's, it's hard to run a program like that. It's hard to run a building uh, like that. So I think uh, the lesson there is, is there a way uh, that we can at least help elected officials, um, ideally the public to better understand that, that more flexibility you know, broader uh, objectives is actually going to be beneficial to, to the housing production and, and serving people who, who need these units. A great point. Uh, well, I, I'll say BPC is, is very committed to finding some, some actionable solutions to all of these challenges. Thank you all so very much for sharing your, your insights, your expertise. Hopefully this is um, one of many continued conversations we can all have about um, how to make this system a little better and get some housing built for folks. Um, uh, the next webinar in this series is actually going to be on March 24th. I hope everyone watching today will RSVP for that one. It's going to be focused on sort of construction innovations that can really help to reduce the costs of construction and to get more housing built. 
Um, so be sure to check that out. Thank you all again. I really appreciate it. Have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.